Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm absolutely delighted to be here in South Korea at Cor Marine, and many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, just briefly, I'm Steve Gordon. I'm the global head of Clarkson Research. We have around 200 people producing data and intelligence around the shipping markets. Uh, we're also part of the broader Clarkson's group, uh, a very old company, an international company, but headquartered in London, which includes the world's largest shipbroker. And we have many long-term friends and partners here in Korea, particularly at the shipyards and with the ship owners. And my organization is delighted to support uh, Korean industry in terms of your contribution, very vital contribution to global shipping. Um, in terms of my uh, presentation today, um, I'm going to cover um, shipping uh, and the outlook in, in part a traditional way. We're going to look at the demands for global shipping in terms of transportation and some of the themes that we expect in the coming decades. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, energy transition, about geopolitics. Uh, we'll talk about where shipping supply is, the global fleet, the addressable market for many of the suppliers that are in the conference, uh, in the conference and exhibition halls next door. Uh, we'll talk about shipbuilding, uh, where the market share is, what the outlook is, where fleet renewal requirements are, and we'll talk about where we are on the decarbonization journey in terms of the technology take-up, alternative fuels, energy-saving technologies. Um, I think it's been a, a fascinating period for the shipping markets in recent years. And we've been talking a lot about managing disruption and going green. Those have been the, th the major themes of recent years. And I believe that those are themes that are going to continue. Uh, I believe there are huge opportunities, as well, of course, huge challenges as we face the decarbonization challenge in front of maritime. Uh, firstly, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with where the shipping industry is today and what it is supporting. Um, the shipping industry is moving around 12 billion tons of global cargo each year at the moment. Uh, that's about 85% of global trade, one and a half tons for every person on the planet. Shipping is absolutely vital to global trade. Um, you can see here the main industries that we're supporting. Uh, over one third of all cargo is energy related, gas, coal, um, uh, you know, oil, oil products. Uh, we have the steel industry, uh, we have agriculture, containers of course, very vital, particularly if you looked at this data in value. This is all in tons, but containerized cargo is typically high value. We also have other cargoes like vehicle trade, um, we have chemicals, we have uh, uh, reefer trade, uh, and then also the shipping industry, as you can see in the circles, is supporting uh, passenger movements. We're now back up to pre-COVID levels in terms of the cruise market. I believe the cruise market is starting to look like an interesting growth market again. Uh, we are, uh, have uh, over 6,000 ports in the world that are being supported by dredgers, by uh, in-port operations of tugs, uh, and we have 6,000 offshore oil and gas fields and 250 offshore wind farms. Offshore wind, a usually exciting market for maritime. So global shipping, 100,000 vessels supporting global trade and offshore energy production. So absolutely vital to the global economy. Um, in terms of recent trends, if you look at the chart in the middle, shipping has been dealing with huge volatility in the last three or four years. Uh, two huge global events and shipping has been deeply impacted. Uh, first, the COVID pandemic. And as you can see, we had a, a very sharp contraction in trade initially, followed by a very steep recovery. It, it looks simple looking back now. You know, instead of going on holiday, going to restaurants, going to bars, we're ordering goods online and that needs to be moved and that's moved by container. Hence, we get a very strong recovery in container volumes initially. Also at that time, we had lots of congestion uh, in the ports. We had um, container freight five times higher than pre-COVID, all-time highs. Then uh, we start to get some of the inflationary pressures that we've seen uh, as the pandemic uh, wore on. 
uh, and especially with the, the uh, Ukraine conflict and the geopolitical response, high energy prices, um, high inflation, high interest rates, and a slowing global trade and a slowing world economy. We've become a little bit more encouraged in recent months. And it is important to look at the data, not, not just in value, but in the, uh, the, the tons of commodity moved by sea. And actually, we're moving into positive territory again. And our forecast for this year is that we will reach 12.3 billion tons. We've also, from that disruption uh, from the uh, Ukraine conflict, seen an increase in the average length of cargo being moved. Some of this is simple geography. We have Russia moving cargo long haul to China and to India, and we have Europe now importing long haul from the United States and Middle East and not taking gas by pipeline. So the last uh, 12, 18 months have been very positive for the tanker and gas carrier industry. We've seen some very high day rates, and that's because of that disruption in trade. And in fact, this year, we feel that ton-mile trade will grow at its quickest rate since 2017, almost double the growth rate of volumes. Volumes about 2%, um, uh, ton-miles at close to 4%. So that's an encouraging trend for the shipping industry. And you can see here, finally, on the right-hand side of this chart, some of the quickest growing seaborne trade uh, patterns in the past 12 months. The first one is the vehicle trade, and we're seeing very strong growth there, and in fact, record day rates in terms of chartering of car carrier units. Uh, the LPG market has also seen very strong rates, and we've seen lots of long-haul exports from the United States to Asia, particularly China. There's been some congestion in the Panama Canal as well. So a range of commodity growth, but containers and minor bulks, probably the markets that are closest to the consumer uh, demand, are the weakest trades, and we have very strong trade growth in some of the large commodities. So 12.3 billion tons, actually quite a good result this year, better than we expected at the start of the year. Uh, what we don't have today is congestion. During the pandemic, uh, the congestion in the global supply chains was one of the main contributory factors to that very strong day rate environment and freight rate environment on the container side. If you really want to understand why container freight was so high, please look at the chart on the left-hand side. It's a simple chart. It just shows you the percentage of the container fleet that was in a port or an adjacent anchorage every day. So it's a simple data point. Pre-COVID, it was around 31%. At the height of the pandemic, it was 37 to 38%. Now, that doesn't sound a lot, but if you take 6 or 7% of the container fleet out of the market, unable to move cargo, that's enough to really move the market to some of those historically high freight rates that we saw. And of course, particularly for the shipbuilding industry, we saw record investment in container new buildings in 2021. And you're still seeing a lot of activity in new buildings today on container, albeit for different reasons. Energy transition. We'll talk at the end of this presentation about where we are with alternative fuels and energy saving technologies, but the energy transition is also going to create fundamental change to the cargo base of shipping. I showed you earlier that over a third of cargo moved by sea is energy. So understanding peak oil, peak gas, peak coal is important for the shipping industry when you're making those long-term investment decisions, particularly around new buildings. A couple of points I would make. This is energy transition, but in the maritime context. So we're trying to be clear on uh, maritime trade and when that will peak. We're very excited about offshore wind. We're also very excited about offshore oil and gas. We need to remember energy security, not just energy transition. And we believe that the offshore oil and gas market has a strong outlook in terms of day rates and utilization. New buildings might flow through a little bit more slowly. We're very positive about gas. I think as a transitional fuel, coal to gas switching, uh, very optimistic. LNG trade today is 400 million tons. 
we believe it could be 650 million tons by the end of the decade. We also believe there are strong opportunities in LPG, ammonia, potentially carbon dioxide, methanol, hydrogen. I think the gases is a really interesting area. Are we as optimistic about coal and growth in trade in coal? Probably not. So it's understanding some of the opportunities and challenges of the global trade going forward from energy transition. Geopolitics. Energy transition, one of the big drivers of the coming decades, and I think geopolitics, one of the big drivers also. Uh, we've had a period in the last 30, 40 years, perhaps since the Berlin Wall came down, where globalization has been driven by Western business norms. Today, we have a different geopolitical environment. We have the West, we have China, we have the Global South, we have countries which it's very difficult or incorrect to trade with at the moment. And so I think that is going to create also disruption, challenges, but also opportunities. And there are some data here around, for example, the United States still importing lots of cargo from Asia. Perhaps the share from China is reduced but the overall share from Asia is still very strong. So at Clarkson's, we still believe in long-term growth in global trade and demand for seaborne transportation, but we do believe it is sensible to factor in maturing growth rates. In the past, we have grown, actually with one or two exceptions, the financial crisis, the COVID crisis, we've grown quite consistently at 3%, good growth. Going forward, I think it's sensible to assume that the gro those growth rates will mature and that there will be winners and losers. Growth but complexity, I think, is the message to take away. Let's talk now a little bit about shipping supply. The global fleet today, 110,000 vessels, 1.6 billion gross tons by the end of the year, 2.4 billion dead weights, 1.4 trillion US dollars. It's a huge addressable market. The supply side of shipping is in a different place today than from 10 years ago. Today, the world fleet is growing at 2 or 3%. It's not growing at 8 or 9%. In the last decade, we had almost constant overcapacity, new buildings, new buildings, new buildings. Today, that situation is in a different place. We have an order book that overall is 13% of the global fleet, which I think is a good place for shipping, actually. It's very uneven, lots of container and lots of gas, lots of car carrier. But when it comes to tankers and bulkers, we have close to 30 year low in terms of new building order books. And I think that gives you a sense of perhaps where some of the opportunities lie for new buildings going forward in the coming years. Again, we do believe that there will be growth in the world fleet but perhaps it will be at more mature growth rates going forward. This is our Clarksy index. It's an average earnings index of tankers, bulkers, containers, and gas carriers. It represents about 80% of global uh, seaborne ship tonnage. Um, today, it's averaging about $23,000, $24,000 per day. That's a good number. Global OPEX average, maybe $8,000 a day. There's still a lot of cash coming into shipping. Actually, last year, there was more money coming into shipping than in the previous boom of 10, 11 years ago, 07, 08. If you exclude the container market today, again, overall shipping is in a relatively good place. We do have a split. The container market is quite weak, whereas the tanker market is very strong. And we expect, with that extra distance of uh, trade being moved, that ton mile element that I mentioned about the tanker market, along with a low order book, we expect a positive couple of years on the tanker side. We think the gas market is in a good place. It might unwind a little bit, but that's from very high levels, and we're seeing that in terms of the new build orders in LNG and LPG. The car carrier market has been at record levels. Offshore oil and gas, day rates, utilization, energy security, not just energy transition, improving markets on the offshore oil and gas side. But on bulk carriers, I think the outlook hopefully is for a gradual improvement, but it's been a difficult year. 
And on the container side, it's the opposite of three years ago. Today, we have zero congestion, we have new buildings coming, and we have low volume growth in terms of containers being moved. So it's an uneven market in terms of the day rates coming into the shipping space. But we do believe at Clarkson's that there's some analysis here we've made around the net uh, earnings after OPEX of individual ships in the current cycle relative to the cycle in 2005 to 2008. In the last cycle, nearly all of the money that ship owners made went into new buildings. Today, and remember the world fleet is 90% bigger in tonnage terms than it was a decade or so ago, we're actually building up still quite a significant amount of cash and we expect that to continue in the short term. Let's talk a little bit about shipbuilding, an absolutely crucial market for South Korea. Firstly, and I mentioned this earlier about the supply side of shipping. The supply side of shipping is in a completely different place from 10 years ago. We believe that there are 145 active shipyards building vessels above 20,000 dead weight today. Uh, that compares to 321 at the top of the market in 2010, 2011, peak production for shipbuilding. If you take all shipyards building above 1,000 gross tons, it's gone from about 1,000 to 350 yards. That's a significant reduction in capacity. We estimate somewhere between 35 and 40% reduction in shipbuilding capacity. That's significant. The two questions we got asked in the last decade continuously well, when the markets get good, they'll just reopen the shipyards. And when the markets get good, the ships will just speed up. I think both of those are challenging things to do in today's environment. Do we think that there is some incremental increases in, in capacity, some gradual increases in capacity? Yes. We're keeping a list of those reactivations in China. We know there's been some limited reactivation here in Korea, less so in Japan but we believe it will be incremental, certainly when we look forward this decade and certainly when we look forward this next five-year period. So incremental increases in shipbuilding capacity. China this year, it will produce nearly 50% of all global shipping output will be from China. This is in compensated gross tons. We think South Korea will be about 27%. We think because of the backlog that Korean yards have built up, particularly on LNG, that the Korean share will increase to 31% over the next couple of years and that China's will declare, decline a little bit. We have Japan fairly stagnant at somewhere between 13, 14, 15%. So we don't see a huge amount of development outside of the big three countries. Europe still has managed to maintain its cruise uh, uh, inventory backlog. That's been quite successful for uh, the cruise industry. Despite all that financial pressure, the support of export credit, support of the US bond markets to the liner companies, the cruise line companies, European cruise ship building uh, has retained its backlog. And I think give it 12 months, I think you'll start to see some cruise new building orders at the big end again. I won't go through this in detail, but we've charted up the order book backlog according to our data in compensated gross tons for individual yard facilities on the left and yard groups on the right hand side. And I've also put in the largest um, output uh, from last year in compensated gross tons because some of the shipyards have gone a little bit longer on their order book than others. The individual facilities is still dominated by the Korean facilities, but CSSC, after its merger with CSIC, is now the largest shipbuilding group. Lots of consolidation here, uh, lots of cost pressures, particularly on the labor side. I know that currency and um, uh, the uh, steel costs have perhaps been a little bit easier this year, but I think the labor costs are still very real. And I think from a supply demand perspective, the average, uh, if you take the order book as a multiple of last year's production, we're running at about 3.6, 3.7 years at the moment. At the start of COVID, that was two and a half years. So the shipyards are in a strong position in terms of their forward order cover and I think there's been a good flow of orders coming in this year. Um, we've had 
strong new building orders in LNG, like we've had in previous years, strong activity in car carriers, a strong flow on containers. This is quite unusual, actually, because I showed you earlier that container freight is low, there's a big order book, there's 30% of the fleet on order, um, so why are the liner companies still ordering green ships? Well, that's the answer. They're ordering it because it's green, it's fleet renewal programs, they've run the analysis on what percentage of their fleet is D or E rated. On the container side, yes, we have 28% of the fleet on order, but we have 30% of the fleet is over 15 years of age, we have 30% of the fleet is D or E rated under CII. So from a liner company perspective, they're taking a long-term view on the new building requirements uh, uh, for their industry. We've also seen an increase in uh, tanker ordering this year, product tankers. We've also seen uh, interest in FPSO. Uh, we've seen a steady flow of bulk carrier orders. So I would say a good flow of new building orders coming to the shipyards. In the long term, we're very clear that fleet renewal requirements are building. We can't be precise about the timing of this, but if you look at the age profile of the fleet on the left-hand side, blue is non-eco, red is, red is eco tonnage, electronic main engine, 20 to 30% more fuel efficient at today's lower speeds. The average age of the fleet is going up, and in some of these markets, some people are worried about the size of the car carrier market and what might happen if there's a weaker world economy in the next couple of years. 48% of the car carrier fleet is over 15 years of age. 32% of the LNG fleet is over 15 years of age, and 32% of, of the LNG fleet is also steam turbine. So there are fleet renewal pressures building. And I think one of the questions you need to ask do you believe on that age profile that the renewal requirements for that fleet will move or be brought forward slightly by the decarbonisation uh, policies that I'll talk about in a moment? So fleet renewal is coming, and I believe this will provide long-term requirements for the shipyards globally, including here in South Korea. Finally, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the decarbonisation challenge that maritime faces. And this is a huge area. So I'm certainly not going to give you great technical guidance on what the right alternative fuel is, but I will give you some thoughts and perspectives from the Clarkson's intelligence that we collect. As I think the previous speaker mentioned, uh, shipping, we estimate, is about 2.2% of global CO2 on a a tank to weight basis, it's about 1.9% of all greenhouse gases on a well to weight basis. We are the most carbon efficient mode of transportation. We must continuously remind our broader stakeholders about shipping's importance, not just in maritime trade, but its carbon efficiency relative to other modes of transportation. We have also had a declining trend. Most of that declining trend is because of slow steaming and the response to overcapacity in the last decade. It's not to do with green policies so far. We have an accelerating regulatory timetable. I won't go through this in detail, but, but I do believe that we'll look back at this year as quite a big turning point. I think in the shipping industry, we quite often complain a lot about the CII or the EEXI. The CII doesn't work properly for crews. It doesn't work properly for LNG. But for the first time this year, we have a global framework on carbon regulation by the IMO. At MEPC 80, we have these accelerated IMO targets. And from the 1st of January next year, less than three months, we are putting a price on carbon for the first time with the EU ETS. And I believe that a global price on carbon will come quite soon. I don't believe it's sustainable to have a price just for trading in European waters. One of the things that we've done at Clarkson's is estimate the uh, CII rating of every single cargo ship in the world fleet. It's roughly one third A and B, one third C, and one third D and E. We're measuring this every day. We have the year to date number on this right hand chart. Uh, shows you actually there's more A's and more E's than we expected. You know, ships 
perform quite unusual trading patterns. It'd be nice to model this assuming every ship uh, operated in a theoretically standard benchmark way, but actually the trading patterns are hugely, huge variety. As we go forward, this becomes more of a challenge. At the moment, uh, it's a little bit early to understand how this will drive investment behavior. In some markets, the charterers are committing to the ship owners to return the ship after the time charter as a mid-sea rated ship, and the ship owners are telling the charterers to slow down during a voyage. In other markets, I don't think they really looked at this properly yet. They don't understand it. There's other priorities. But as we collect the data, as it filters through into financing, into insurance, into chartering policy, we believe that this, along with other issues like the EU ETS, will drive an increasingly tiered market. Tiered market between the good ship with the best emission rating, better day rate, tiered markets in terms of earnings, in terms of residual value, in terms of your financing, in terms of your insurance. So we do believe this will drive investment behavior. We already see trends in speed. I, I've described this in the past as like putting a straitjacket on shipping. You know, speed is a mechanism for the market. When the markets are good, when the markets are tight, you speed up. When the markets are weak, you slow down. It's a way of managing capacity. But also, if we remember and keep it simple, one ton of conventional fuel, three tons of carbon dioxide. So one of the, the things that you can do immediately to reduce emissions is speed. And we see a long-term trend. And yes, when the markets are good, ships speed up a bit. When the markets are weak, they slow down. But it's at a lower volatility range from previously. This tightens markets potentially, and this could drive requirements for new ships also. Uh, the EU ETS. Uh, again, I do believe this is a significant milestone for the shipping industry. On alternative fuels, we're just at the start. There are 1,000 ships out of 100,000 on the water today that have alternative fuel. It's 6% in tonnage terms, but it's 49% of the order book in tonnage terms. On the order book, car carriers, containers, almost exclusively alternative fuel. It's all dual fuel still. We're moving to a multi-fuel future. Methanol, particularly on the container market, has made good progress in the last 12 months. LNG, if you include LNG carriers, is still the largest alternative fuel. Um, I believe we are moving to a multi-fueled future, future, and all of these investments are absolutely vital. And you can hear, see here some statistics. I think we have to accept that different fuels for different types of ships, I think for very small ships, battery hybrid is a, a, a battery, very, very sensible solution. I think very large ships, we have LNG, we have methanol, we have some meth, uh, ammonia orders in our order book statistics for the first time recently. Um, but I think for a mid-sized ship, I wonder whether conventional fuel is still sensible today, but just make sure you have as many energy-saving technologies as possible. Optionality. I think the ship owners are looking for as much optionality, much flexibility as they can manage. We know some of this optionality in terms of ready status. Some of it means something. Some of it doesn't mean so much in terms of the capex allowance made. But ship owners, and also I think this is very helpful when you're marketing your projects to your financiers, to your insurers, and to your broader stakeholders. I also believe that there is a decision that ship owners need to make, new build versus retrofit. Again, I've put up the age profile of the world fleet. We have a challenge around how do we support, either by life extension or fleet renewal, this large bubble of ships that was built in the last boom. We all remember the heady days of shipbuilding production. China was building lots of greenfield yards. Korea was incredibly busy, highest ever utilization. Do we replace those ships early with new buildings, or do we invest for life extension through the many energy-saving technologies that are being developed? And there's fantastic innovation huge, positive, tremendous innovation ongoing. And a lot of it you can see in the conference and exhibition halls in this 
uh, arena. Here we're collecting air bubble lubrication data, very good granularity on the data. If you're interested, we have a team of engineers that try and build as much data as they can around the individual equipment models and their energy saving technology and the number of ships that is, uh, this is added to. And I think going forward, we feel very strongly that there is no single solution to decarbonization. We have to consider this as a multi-levered approach. This is just a scenario. It's not a forecast from Clarkson's. We're too early. But what we are doing in this scenario is four things to help us meet the decarbonization target that the IMO has set. There's net zero. Net zero doesn't mean zero carbon dioxide. And for example, I'm very interested in a lot of the carbon capture technology that's being developed at the moment, also from a shipping transportation perspective. But here we do four things. Firstly, we accept that global trade will not grow at the 3% that it grew at in the previous 30 years, because that's gonna create a huge amount of transportation requirement, lots of energy required to support that transportation. So perhaps growth rates in shipping decline a little bit. And I think there'll be winners and losers. I've been very positive about gas, less so about coal, very excited about offshore wind. There are 12,000 offshore wind turbines today. We believe that in 2030, there will be 30,000 offshore wind turbines producing electricity. It's 0.4% of global uh, power today. It could be 9% by the middle of the century. So lots of changes in trade. Number two, every ship in the world fleet goes 15% slower. Engineers may say that's impossible. Well, the, the entire world fleet on average is going 20% slower today than it was in 2008. So I think there's room for a little bit of a slowdown, but I think perhaps every ship going to nine knots may be a bit extreme. Third thing, every single ship becomes an eco ship. Electronic main engine, energy saving technologies, air bubble lubrication, Flettner rotors, kites, as many energy saving technologies that work for your ship as possible. And then fourthly, we have a fundamental change in the fuel mix. It's too early to know exactly what the fuel of the future will be. I believe it will be multi-fueled. I believe we're in a competition for fuel. There will be a fight for the green fuels. And that's another area that we've been tracking very closely. But all of these solutions, and particularly the third and the fourth, will require huge innovation from marine equipment suppliers, from shipyards, we believe that there, we are moving into an upswing in shipbuilding, where there will be a sustained requirement for shipbuilding demand globally as we renew the fleet around this fundamental fueling transition that we have in front of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to my talk today. Lots of statistics. I'd be very happy to share them separately if you're interested. I think the themes, as I mentioned, you know, managing disruption and going green. I believe shipping faces a huge decarbonization challenge, but I do believe the opportunities, particularly for shipyards and for marine equipment suppliers that are you know, the core of this audience and of the forum here, huge opportunities going forward to step up to those challenges to help deliver the green ship program that the world uh, fleet needs in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening.